Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, 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 everyone. Duncan here with another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, where we chat with founders and leaders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. I'm excited to be here today. We've got a great guest coming up. Uh, and uh, thank you for tuning in. This is the latest episode of the Firebelly Social Show. And this episode is brought to you by Firebelly Marketing, a company I founded where we help mission-driven food and beverage brands bring people closer through social media marketing. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest today. And this, this guy has so much going on. I'm, we're going to just talk about it on the fly. Uh, Nick Brune from Eco Caters. Nick, be so welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Duncan. And I didn't even check. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Brune. Yes, that's right. All right. This, this is all, all Bill Burgeon's fault for me getting your name right because he gave you a shout out. It was so crazy that he did that last week and that you were booked this week. So this is amazing. Well, uh, Nick, you got a lot going on, man. Tell us about some of the ventures that are top of mind for you. Um, well, you know, right right now I'm I'm <laughs> Work. I just partnered with an oyster farm. Actually, uh, I, I'm big time as my, my company's Eco Caters. I'm a founder of Eco Caters, right? So I'm a big time sustainability freak when it comes to food and beverage and our supply chain. So I somehow ran across an oyster company, and uh, we're going to be the largest leaseholder on the Gulf of Mexico here. So helping them raise money right now. I help train other companies, uh, add food and beverage revenue, or add catering revenue to their businesses, whether it be restaurants or other catering businesses. So. Um, yeah, I, I I definitely stay busy. You are a busy guy, Nick. And this this uh, partnership with, uh, if I'm not much mistaken, with I'm going to say it correctly, with the Florida Oyster Trading Company. This is kind of interesting. Other than the mission and what you're going to be doing with them, it kind of is like bringing a lot of your interest together in one place too. Definitely. I mean, I. You'll learn soon as as we talk about all this. I'm a man of the ocean. I love, uh, you know, I'm a seafood chef when it boils down to it. That's probably still what I'm best at, right? So, uh, you know, I, I've I, I moved to Florida recently. Uh, you know, I, I don't have much network here, and kind of starting a, a, another food and beverage company uh, or like a restaurant wasn't really in the cards for right now. I got kids, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this this is just a perfect thing for me because I love the sustainability side of oysters. They just are, are working for us right now in the water, cleaning our ocean, right? And on top of that, I love oysters from a raw standpoint, char grilled standpoint. You know, I love tasting different oysters from all over the globe because that's what makes them taste different, right? These different estuaries and what's coming out, that water quality. So um, I'm I'm obsessed with oysters from from you know start to finish, and now I've learned so much more about the industry um, and how game changing it is. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to be involved. That's amazing to bring all that together in one place and to be able to taste oysters from all over the world. Not to mention, as you were saying in the pre-show, that oysters are actually a great source of protein. Oh my God! Well, I mean, they're they're one of the best things a male can put in their bodies, actually, just because the zinc, right? Um, so, I mean, it's, 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 they're, they're, they're fantastic source of protein for us in general, which we're going to need in the future here. We, we've got to realize that all of our wild oysters are gone. 80 to 90% of them are, are gone. They're probably not going to come back on the levels they were before. So um, these are things that are needed, not only to clean our waterways, but definitely to supply a, a ever-growing food chain. That's amazing. And um, how did you get started with all this? You're a chef at heart. So I'm I'm curious to know how you got started. Well, at some point in Eco Caters, you know, Eco's probably 17, 18 years old now, right? So at some point in Eco Caters, I think about seven, eight years in, I, I had to realize that I had to step outside of the kitchen, right? I'd done restaurants, we'd done a few different things and it just gotten crazy. And 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 the cooking side was great. And I still love uh, cooking. Uh, but I had to kind of really I had to learn the business side. And so I joined a networking group called EO that really changed my life, entrepreneurs organization. Yeah. And anyone who's drank that Kool-Aid, it's an amazing organization. I, I wish I could still be a part of it. They just don't have one around me here. Um, but I started learning more and more about business and I started getting obsessed. And I started actually, you know, you <laughs> You talk to 95% of chefs and looking at a computer is the last thing they want to do in, in any format, right? Unless it's maybe playing video games, right? So for me, I had to convince myself that I, I actually liked modeling and liked 
uh, building models on the computer for you know and 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 actually understanding like some forecasting and starting to to really oh oh my gosh i don't really know what sales are is is at all you know like i really didn't i i I thought i did i thought that sales was oh a lead comes through and we pitch them stuff but i didn't really understand sales i didn't really understand marketing so it was time for me to step out of the kitchen and really grow my business and when i did that that was when i was able to 5x my company and from there you know not not many people build a catering company to that size right so so we're able to you know say okay we're we're experts here i've done it my entire life i mean eco caters is 17 years old but before that i had another catering company with another chef that wasn't quite successful but i was doing it i started catering the largest crawfish boils with my dad in the world in fort lauderdale cajun music zydeco festival back in the 90s right so I've been catering my entire life. I know a lot about it. And I've done personal chef work all the way with celebrities and all that stuff. So like that whole side of things, I know very well. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of also bring that to uh, that expertise to other people, because especially after when COVID kind of smoked our company and hit everyone's everyone pretty hard, like, you know, chefs just have really had a hard time over the last decade and they need a lot more support in order to cross that barrier. And and most people think it's about the food. They just don't understand it's, it's a marketing driven business. It's a marketing driven business. And um, I mean, food experiences are driven in my opinion by chefs. And so, you know, everything from what they're interested in, how they want the food to come out, how they want you to enjoy the food, it's, I mean, for me, it's a chef, it's a chef driven experience. And it's one of the reasons I don't actually like corporate restaurants is because you're, you're kind of disconnected from the person whose vision it is. And I understand that I understand that model. And, you know, that's, I, mean, I know we need that, but, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, one of my dearest friends, uh, I didn't talk to you about this in the pre-show. One of my dearest friends was the founder of an iconic um, New Orleans restaurants, uh, Visco's. And uh, from everything I heard about him, and that was in the 70s and 80s, and everything I heard about him, you know, and I've I've, uh, been to Commanders, that is an iconic place to work. Um, And you were you were the man like what, what did that do for you in terms of your experience after that from being there? So I worked at Mr. B's and because of that, I was able to do a little stint at Commanders. Right. And um, and kind of work around the old Brennan's kind of tree, you know, and. I'll tell you that that's where I realized that food had a whole nother level. I mean, I, I I grew up, my mom can cook, my dad can cook, my brother can cook, my grandparents can cook on both sides. You know, I mean, it was like normally Christmas was a fight over who was going to cook the best Christmas dinner. You know, Christmas Eve was one family, Christmas Day was the next. And there was always kind of a comparison, right? I mean, it, everyone can cook. I mean, I, I so... I, I I just I I was completely addicted to food from the beginning, and I I just um, uh, when I went over to New Orleans, it was just like oh my god, this is when I when I saw that French butter sauces, and I mean look my my restaurant went through like forty thousand pounds of butter a year, it was crazy. So just to learn this this bulk in like three different steam kettles cranking with with uh, stocks and just like it was it was real deal high level french cuisine and and that's when i was like oh my gosh uh, this this is there is another level to food right um and i i will say after being in the south my entire life and growing up in new orleans i i that's when i moved to cali is about after spending a couple of years there i i found that next level but i i i that french thing that extreme butter sauce thing which i still love don't get me wrong but I was ready to to see something new, right? Other than fried fried food and 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 you know uh, New Orleans barbie shrimp, which is still one of my favorite things on this planet, right? But so I moved out to the West Coast, and that's where I started catering and, and you know some of the most ridiculous parties I've ever seen in my life, and that's where I actually truly fell in love with catering again. That's amazing. And is that how your world and Bill Burgeon's world overlapped is your love of sustainability and uh, the environment and like less food wastage? I'd, I'd say it's just more over me actually stepping out of the kitchen, like I said, and and starting to network with the world and outreach. Right. So I, I started to just build a, a bigger network of, of, of a community uh, right around myself. 
of really smart and just amazing people. Um, uh, one of his good friends had a company called uh, uh, Smart Cube. Um, and, um, you know, he introduced me to Bill. And from there, you know, Bill and I have just kind of met here and there and talked about different business ideas along the way. And then, of course, when he came up with the original name, Soggy Food Sucks, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> uh, we started kind of talking about that a little bit. So, Well, you must have made a great impression on him because when he um, referred to his friends uh, who are chefs, um, he you were the first person he referred to. So, um, you know, let's talk, talk about your vision of sustainability. I'd love to hear more about that. And you obviously are very passionate about it. Yeah, you know, for me, I I, I feel there's a big marketing problem right now. Um, and I I feel like if I say the word sustainable, that I'm like connected to the World Economic Forum, or I'm like some extreme far sided thing. And I think that oil is bad or whatever and and for me I, I i think that there's a big marketing problem when it comes to sustainability and there's a lack of understanding of the insane positivity that has happened over the last decade alone i mean like i especially in our oceans and in our waterways and yes there's work to do of course there's always work to do but i i think um the the shaming of people within that is not the way to get it done um, I think it's talking about how great some of these things are. So for me, from a sustain, sustainability perspective from the food and beverage industry, you know, I mean, I, I, I literally even had people say, oh, your food's organic and walk by. Like, it's like, well, what does that mean? So what, there's a misunderstanding here. And I think that term has been kind of turned into something that it's really not even anymore. And I don't even know if I trust that term when it comes to our food and beverage industry to begin with. So I, I, that's kind of a, a, a far, far, far rant to some other side there. But for me, when when, when I want to see sustainability, I, I just I miss the real, true local foods. Like I grew up in Louisiana. I know for a fact that you can't get some of that food anywhere. I, when when it says undo in California, it's not undoing. It's just not. It's not made in the correct format. Half the time, it's not even smoked. It's not chunked meat. I can go on and on and on. So for me, I think the locality of food and and not this globalization of food, which I don't mind it because it's also I it allowed me to cook some amazing things. And uh, as Americans, we combine it into this, all these ridiculous combinations of everything and make this new American food that's awesome. But I like I love the fact that I can't get a good biscuit in California and I can't get a good taco in Louisiana. That is awesome to me. Like, I mean, that that's the way it should be. And so I, I feel like if we can focus more on locality as far as product, right, and 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 quit worrying so much about you know having everything, um, I think that's going to be a big step. And I think you're already seeing people warn everyone about. And again, take politics aside, but but you're you're getting these warnings about what's about to happen to the food and beverage industry, to our supply chain, and to the fact that we're not going to have enough food. Everyone's going to have to start eating crickets, right? So, I mean, I I, I think that there's there's there needs to be some true education. People need to really start to look into what they eat and why. And I think locality is the biggest thing. And for me, that, that's, that's why I love this oyster company. I also like food that is being produced in a way that is, is is sustainable for agriculture, right? I know that mass agriculture has its problems. We have to feed a lot of people for sure, right? So we know that mass agriculture has its problems. How, how can we, we're, we're smart enough to fix these things now. We're flying to Mars, get, get, get out of here. We can figure it out, right? And in a true sustainable way, you put oysters in the water, they clean the water for you, you, you are, or and, and right now people are creating these clusters where you'll have like a mangrove farm with an algae farm with oysters all working together. You create an entire ecosystem, which is going to put more shrimp in our water, which is going to, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to clean that. It's going to, you know, we have so much nutrient going into our water and we have no oysters to clean them anymore. Right. So 
this is kind of going back and forth, uh, and I apologize about that. But uh, I guess the bottom line for for this is the supply chain is what is what needs to be focused on from a sustainability standpoint in the food and beverage industry. In my mind, I mean you're 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 speaking your truth, man, and it's like oxygen for me because I mean this is what you care about. I mean this is the heart and soul of eco caterers, and I I think it's it's a super important message that people need to hear that. You know, whether you want to look at it or you don't want to look at it, I mean, we have ha- the impact that we've had on our world is irreversible in many ways. And so, you know, how we evolve into the future and some of the, this model, this brilliant model that you're talking about, where we're building ecosystems, you know, uh, so that we can eat the things we eat and we can also do some good along the way. That's an important message. Um, how do you um, how do you feel? Um, it's and it's really interesting that you you talked about the the you know people immediately make assumptions when you're talking about sustainability. Um, do you do you find that the UN actually anything being being associated with the UN is probably a bad thing at this point because people don't a lot of people at least in the US don't want to think about that. Yeah, well, when you talk about the SDGs again, it can go in the wrong direction and. You know, can some of those goals maybe have um, an underground, I mean, a, a back, a, a, an underground, like what they really want to have a different agenda, I should say, maybe, a pr- probably, to be honest, if, if you follow some of the money, once I really start to do research, I was on a panel at the UN in 2018, um, with a bunch of entrepreneurs from all over the country, all over the world, talking about water conservation and all the SDGs, and I was focused on water conservation, and, you know, I, I don't know, and, and I'm, I'm not like, again, I, I don't, I'm not saying this or that it's factual. I just don't know what was accomplished from that meeting, whether anything got done or whether people were there patting themselves on the back, talking about how great they are, how, how they, how they're, you know, doing these, how they want to do these sustainable things, how we're going to change the world by, by starting with entrepreneurs. And I, and I will say COVID hit. I was excited about what was going on with that group. COVID hit and that, that whole thing kind of got shut down because we couldn't meet again the next year. But um, I, I, I just I don't know what all got accomplished rather than just talk. And so I, I think this, again, smaller local, um, uh, if you're going to support that, like, go go see what's actually happening with your money. And go go see what's act like if you want to support something, right? And because I think some of the goals are great, right? That the UN have put together. I mean, look, if you don't think we've affected the world in some way at this point, then come on, you're you're a little bit maybe too extreme on on the other side, right? So there, there's there's very simple ways that that we can farm sustainably. It's been proven a thousand times over and over again in this country. And that we can, this new blue economy, man, we keep forgetting, and I'm, I'm writing an article about it soon, we, we keep forgetting the largest part of this world is our oceans, and we don't really use it at all. Uh, like, my, my question to Elon Musk right now is, Mars, do we don't even know what's going on right here. In the largest part of our world, the most expansive part of our world, we really have no understanding of what's happening. And we can farm for miles out there. And it needs cleaning. It needs these things. We, we have, we're pumping, we have uh, what's called nutrient excess right now going on in virtually every estuary in any major uh, first world country or and even third worlds, right? That is a big problem, right? When it comes to algae blooms that then take all the oxygen out of the water and kill everything. The only thing that used to clean that was every estuary on this planet was filled with oysters. Now they're not. <laughs> they're gone. So, so again, I keep going back to this because this is what I know right now. But that, that's, a very, that's a very simple thing to see and to say, okay, well, how can we fix this? Okay, well, with oyster farming, and we can put them at the estuaries to where it can filter our water, and with mussel farming, and with clam farming, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, kelp farming, right? All these things, those things grow for a reason. Seagrass. We were talking to a guy the other day that's got a, a robot for 20 grand that plants seagrass. That's insane. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like those things had, they, they were part of our ecosystem. They're filters, and they're gone now. So we, we've got to figure out figure out that. So it's the same thing on the land. 
I, I love the I love the the practicality and your calm, compelling vibe. I mean, it just I think it's 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 far more effective than the than the preachy, you know, make make everyone feel like shit vibe that you usually see. So uh, thank you for thank you for your passion. And look, you're you're clearly I mean, everything that you do is very creative. Um, I wanted to ask about the soundbite dinner series and lot eight. I mean, those are very interesting experiences. Yeah, man, that's uh, it's crazy. I wouldn't expect you to bring those up, but yeah. So lot eight uh, was basically one of the turning points of our business. I I had just got some new business partners on board, um, and he, one of them came up to me and he's like, he was managing this hotel that was his business. He he runs hotels. And um, uh, he was like, dude, we got this parking lot behind this hotel and it's 50 years old. Can you do anything with it? I was like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> so we threw up a 12 foot redwood fence and dropped in a shipping container. The first thing I went and bought was a horse trailer. We turned into a bar and. And, uh, you know, lot eight was born and it was really successful. So we were able to put a roof on on about half of it to to kind of, and, and, you know, it was big fans and projection and really kind of take it to the next level. And uh, yeah, it's a great, you know, venue for San Diego for that in, indoor outdoor vibe. Um, it's sitting right there in Mission Valley. It's very affordable. Um, so it, it was it was kind of a, a good little little Kickstarter for for us to kind of re, re, relaunch Eco Caters. And this was, I think, eight years ago at this point. And so it's been it's been very successful. We're happy. With, we're very happy with Lot 8. And Soundbite was was definitely was one of my favorite things. And I'm, I'm actually going to do some of those here in Pensacola here soon. And that is so I actually moved to Los Angeles managing a band. OK. Um, and I've, I was a DJ. I threw raves in New Orleans back in the day. I threw rock shows in, in, in Baton Rouge in college. I was, I was big time into music as well as food. I think that's, that, that's, a, that happens a lot. Um, and so I, um, you know, just one night I was having dinner with a friend and it just hit me that I, I, there's food and music, you know, I'm in an Italian restaurant. They're playing Italian music. Okay, great. But then there's there's really taking a, a song and and taking its meaning and creating a dish off of that song, right? And you know the first thing that came to my mind was like how my wife and I met and how we were traveling back and forth and you know how we ate all these random. She was in South Carolina, I was in New Orleans, and we'd meet up in random spots and just eat this, these these meals. And so when I listen to a song about you know maybe love, I think about these things. And so I was like, oh my gosh, so we started pairing food with individual tracks and when that when that started coming together it was just it was just perfect so our, our first show was with Tori Rose she's a really good friend of mine in San Diego and just an insane talent um and should be uh extremely famous um but uh she put together you know gave me five songs and we listened to every single one of them over and over and over again and basically created our menu based off that song, off those songs. And the way that it goes live is the artist explains their song, why they wrote it and what it meant to them. And then the chef explains what the song meant to them and why they created that dish and kind of how they created that dish. During those explanations, the dish gets served and then they play the song live while you eat that dish, right? And I mean, you know, there were songs about climbing mountains and I literally went and climbed that tallest mountain in San Diego, picked food along the way, found like natural watercress, picked a bunch of grass. I was baking things in, found these mushrooms and, and, and made an insane meal for 60 people, an insane dish based off of climbing a mountain. Right. And uh, and connected it to a song. So it was very, very connected. Just it was it was just a really great experience. I mean, um, just so inspiring to hear you talk about it. Um, and I, I wanted to say, um, I, as I've been reading about you and 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 um, researching for the show, I also came across the term conscious cooking. Mm. Um, yeah. That is an interesting uh, interesting phrase. Let me ask you this: you you were recently on uh, the road to recovery. Uh, the future of food and, and featured on there. What was that all about? And what was that like? Let's see. Uh, Road to recovery, future of food. Um, so 
you know, basically what, what what you know what, what that's talking about is again i think that's that's going back to the supply chain right and and kind of how do we fix the supply chain but also it's it's a staffing thing i think it was talking a lot about staffing as well right, right? um uh when when they went to go turn the lights back on so to speak um you know it's not like you know i we had over 100 employees you know you can't just it, it just doesn't happen. Like you don't have the business. You don't, you know, those people are all scattered now. Maybe they studied something else over the last two years and moved on with their lives. You know, it's, it's, it's not like you can just turn, turn on the employees again. Right. So it was kind of a, um, you know, a real focus on again, the supply chain, but then also how, how, how are we able to restaff this industry? And to be honest at our time, our government was literally saying words like i like the food industry like prop doesn't make much sense as an employer as an employee and things like you should probably look for other jobs and it's just like do y'all want to eat i i'm i'm baffled by that like it's it's kind of important right and so for me i think it's it's a refresh. I think a lot of the people, maybe even like me, kind of kind of moved on to other different things from a consulting standpoint or just sales or did, doing something completely different in general. So I think it's time to really dig down deep and and, and grab the, the younger generation and really start to bring them up and re-educate because there are people that love food no matter what. I think that will always, I know that, that will, there will always be that. Someone will always want to be a chef. I hope so at least, right? So, so I think it's time we grab that younger generation, start to bring them up, start to train them. And to be honest, uh, uh, having learned more about sales and training salespeople, et cetera, et cetera, I, I forgot who it was, but one guy was telling me we were hiring these younger people, like literally like 21 year old people to go manage, you know, a hundred plus thousand dollars a month in, in sales. And I'm like nervous about it. And he's like, look, man, we've got 19 year olds flying F-15s over our heads. They can handle it. And it's like, huh. You know, you, you just don't realize, of course, I mean, they have everything they need up here to come and cook and do it, do what we need to do. They just need to be trained and they need to be excited and they not need, they, 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 they don't need to be yelled at, like, you know, kind of the old chef way used to be. And, and sometimes that's effective and whatever that has its place, I guess. But, um, you know, I think the new generation reacts differently to those things. You know, I, I, when a chef used to yell at me, it's yes, yeah, chef. And I just kept to work. I didn't even think twice about it. Right now, feelings get hurt and 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 you got an HR issue on your hands and you don't have a happy employee. So as an owner and as as a CEO, our job is to work for them and make them happy. So, you know, we, we've got to kind of think differently about that. I mean, Nick, that is b beautifully put. You know, um, as a leader, you have to serve your team. You're exactly right. That's that's b b beautifully put. I mean, I, I know we talked a little bit earlier about what you're really excited about right now. Is it, um, you know, tell me in, a, in a, just a couple of sentences, what are you excited about next? Man, to, to be honest, I, I just love food tech. I love the future of food and where it's going. Like I, I want to be the first guy who, who gets the drone delivered to me. I know that's already happened, so it's too late for that. But, you know, like I, 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 I just, I love, um, you know, I, this industry hasn't changed. We're archaic. Everything around us has changed. And, and there's some great shifts that have passed that, that have put some like crazy thoughts in my like some guys like we why we we eat with the fork, the knife, and a spoon for well over a hundred something, hundred plus years, right? And he's like, no one's ever rethought anything. Now, I don't think we need to rethink the fork, the knife, and spoon personally. I, I don't know if we need to go that far, but I I I love I love how deep people are thinking about this finally. I mean, you know, we're still cooking in 200 pans and putting food in Schaefer's. Get out of here. That's the worst place ever for any dish. And everyone knows it. And, and, and yet we still do it in the 21st century. And yes, there's some technology now, but it's incredibly expensive. It doesn't make sense for, for a lot of things. It's like, it's, it, and, and then we've got pans. We've got army pans and rondos that don't fit a single burner. They don't fit two burners. They don't fit four burners. Where do these things belong? Because we're using all these old things still in the industry. So I, I, 
you know, it would take a lot of money, but it's going to happen. And and I see someone coming in and truly rethinking the kitchen, truly rethinking the salt pay pan, truly rethinking the 200 pan um, uh, and, and everything we do. So what really, truly excites me is, is that, man, just the kind of watching the future of food come come to life. And, um, you know, I think there's going to be a little bit of a fight. And I think all chefs need to start to stand up and talk about these supply chain issues and talk about where they get their food from, stand up for their local farmers, because farmers are protesting around the world for a reason. And it's going to be at a farmer near you very soon. So I think it's time that the chef industry starts to stand up as well for 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 some of those farmers and some of those people also. Uh, I love I love it. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you are such a creative guy. You're you've done all these interesting things. I, I love the reference to music. You know, we had a guy on here recently, Eric Kwong, um, coincidentally, uh, also from Southern California, um, decided that didn't want to drink Red Bulls and raves anymore. Mm-hmm. And I started a company called Yate, and it's like uh, Herba Mate tea, specifically geared towards the music industry. But my question, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. My question is like, how do you take care of yourself? You know, and how do you think, I know we talked about this earlier. How do you think, other founders need to take care of themselves as they go out and do this big work. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll talk about it and and, and, and I can tell you, I'm not the best at it myself and I've got to practice it uh, every day. And I'm, you know, I think it kind of goes like this in life. Um, and, 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 and we got to stay focused on our health. Um, I think it's extremely important. Um, I, I I think when it comes to mental health, I think the chef industry is, is, is in need of a lot of help. Um, from a uh, toxic intake perspective, from whether it be smoking or cannabis or uh, or drinking or whatever it may be, um, I, I think you know just how we interact and, and all those things. I think mental health is should be really brought to the front of the table. I think one one way to handle that is um, is absolutely to take better care of ourselves um, physically. Right from the get go, um, I, you know, I I think I think that gets lost. I mean, we we just work these days uh, that can be you know ten, twelve, fourteen hours, um, especially as owners in the industry. Um, uh, that can that can be you know you you lose track how how you go through the whole day. You forget to drink water and, and eat anything, and you're surrounded by water and food. And so it's 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 definitely important. It's almost it's 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 like prep or anything else it's almost like you got to calendar it out like put it on your schedule right like from this time to this time is my time and you know whether maybe it's meditation maybe it's starting with even a, a walk around a few blocks around the restaurant or around your your house before you go there whatever it may be um i i i think that uh it's something that needs to be focused on for sure um i was telling you i I wrote a little uh, planner, like it's a 90 day guide. And it basically, you know, the, for the first hour and a half, there, there's this morning time that's yours. Okay. That's, that's your morning time. And, you know, that, that could be fo- focused on a few different things, but always, I think journaling um, is, is something that chefs could, could definitely do from number one, like I think getting better perspective, but also from a mental health perspective. Uh, I love meditation. And I think obviously, like I said, that exercise within that time, 15 minutes even a day can be an absolute game changer for, for the mental health um, and, and, and for yourself. And um, it'll help on those 12 to 14 hour shifts for sure. Nick, you have been amazing. Thank you so much You know, for sharing so much uh, of your journey. And um, thank you for coming on the show, but also thank you for doing what you've done because you're really... I always make a point, you know, to, to thank our guests uh, um, for making the world better. I mean, you're clearly making the world better. You're a thought leader and, you know, um, we need to listen to what you're saying. So uh, thank you again for everything you do. Nick, how can people find you? Um, you know, LinkedIn's a good place. Um, you know, that, that's probably my, my, my best place right now for, for connection. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always willing to have conversation build community on LinkedIn and talk about what, what I'm doing and what we're doing. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to be launching um, a new uh, product here for, for, for lead generation for the catering industry here soon. So 
you'll you'll be seeing all that come out of there. And so yeah, I'd say LinkedIn is probably my bet my best place or Nick at seven figure food and beverage dot com. That's awesome. Nick at seven figure uh, food and beverage dot com. And and we're going to be expecting to hear soon about what's happening with the Florida Oyster Trading Company and your adventures uh, there. Again, another amazing initiative to not only feed people with good food, but also do some great uh, for the world. Thank you uh, so much, Nick. Uh, you've been listening to the Firebelly Social Show, where we talk to amazing founders and leaders of mission-driven food and beverage companies. I'm so happy for today's guest. Uh, total serendipity, the ways uh, we are connected and we just met. So thank you again, everyone for listening and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.